Hi, and welcome to the Org Dev Podcast. So how do you develop the capability of your leaders so they're able to deliver on your strategy when you're in one of the most competitive industries in the world? And how do you support your leaders to take critical decisions that will impact the future of your organization? To help us answer these questions, we've invited the brilliant Dr. Aidan Harney from Intel as our guest on the Org Dev Podcast this week to shine a light on these and many other interesting questions. Dr. Aidan is the OD Director for the Greater European Area, and prior to that, he was Global OD Leadership Development Manager for Fab, Sort and Manufacturing. These are technical terms that will come to throughout this podcast as well. So Intel is the world's largest manufacturer of central processing units and semiconductors. In fact, it's very likely that the device that you're watching this or listening to this podcast on is actually powered by Intel. He's responsible for strategizing, shaping and driving Intel's organization transformation and leadership effectiveness. He's based in Ireland and also works internationally. He has a PhD and his PhD was on the meaning making structures of outstanding leaders in complex dynamic environments. He's also a chartered fellow of the CIPD and holds a master's in HR strategies. So it's probably quite useful just to have a bit of a think about Intel. So Intel was founded 55 years ago, and it's really one of Silicon Valley's iconic organizations. It has 132,000 employees across the world with a footprint and a supply chain in different locations around the world. And last year, it had revenues of approximately $63 billion. So it's an American multinational company based out of California. And it's had a really important moment in history. It's had a strategic inflection point. And this is reflected with the big announcement in 2021 by the CEO of a major new strategy to actually start manufacturing its chips for other organizations. And it's also embarked on the largest architectural shift in 40 years as it launched a range of AI features in its laptops and PCs. So it's taken a really revolutionary approach to the uncertainty in the operating environment around it. So it makes a really interesting conversation to speak to someone who's actually at the vanguard of OD in their organization. So welcome, Dr. Aiden. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for the invite. Brilliant. Lovely to have you here, Aidan. Thank you. So Global OD and Leadership Development Manager, what does just tell us a bit about that role. What does that involve? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I love the introduction, uh, Garen and Danny, and maybe if we just flesh that out a tiny bit more first, and then I can move to the role. Uh, you mentioned, Garen, the inflection point, and our new, uh, re- relatively new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, Pat was actually mentored by employee number three of Intel, Andy Grove. And uh, Andy Grove, the sort of legendary uh, leader during the 80s and the 90s for Intel, but now that Pat is back, we are undergoing a, a huge transformation that you mentioned. And in simple terms, what it means is Intel taking all of our IP and all of our technology and all of our knowledge. And although we traditionally would have manufactured for customers within in- Intel, if you like, now really the strategy is opening up the doors. And if our customers and indeed our competitors want to come in and use that amazing technology to design silicon solutions, with us, then that, that's the, the game changing strategy for the future. So it's a real strategic shift to what we're calling the foundry model, where you know we're going to create capacity and we're going to enable those that don't have fab fabrication me- mega plants uh, to come in and work with us and create amazing solutions. So in that regard, that means uh, a business model change. It means huge structural change. It means obviously uh, technologically huge change. Uh, and even the famous Andy Grove, Grovian culture changing somewhat too, interestingly. So yeah, I've been here pretty much 10 years now. And I think every year has been very exciting, but I would say right now is, is, a, is a particularly exciting time to be an OD and D. And, and um, yeah, so I can tell you a little bit more about the role <laughs> with that context. Really, yeah, and it, it, it's. I think you have to, for those that are watching, it's really worth going onto YouTube and just looking at the scale of the manufacturing plants. These are like twenty billion plants. Yeah, the U.S. president is a regular visitor to Ohio to go and look at the opening of all these. They've actually created special access to, to support chips being manufactured in this particular way. It's it's huge, isn't it? This movement, and the actual locations that you do it, the clean rooms are, are again something that needs to be seen to be believed. The scale and and also the environment that people operate in as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're huge. You know, they are mega projects. And really, the, the strategy at the moment for Intel is just looking at, you know, the global balance for where we manufacture chips, 
making sure that that is balanced, making sure that the supply chain is balanced, because that's very important for the future. As you said, Garen, in terms of if you work or play in a laptop, chances are it's powered by an Intel semiconductor. Uh, if you if you unwind and relax and your Netflix streams beautifully, that's something that's very important as well. Uh, in the near future, if you bring a taxi and a driverless taxi arrives, that autonomous driving taxi is a big bet for the future. But quite apart from that, then you get into, you know, governments, education, defense, that, you know, semiconductors really have a, a huge span across all of our lives. So it's it's important for everybody. And uh, yeah, I think just last week in, in Ireland, in Leek Slip, we had a group of transition year students visiting us. And you just see that the eyes light up when they get gowned up and uh, and, and go into the, the clean room environment. It's, it's another world, as you said. Yeah, it's fascinating technology. Uh, creating some of the world's most complicated technologies from sand. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, and there was a really good quote, I think, from your CFO, and he said, I think he said something along the lines of, uh, we take the world's most abundant material and the rest is talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, that's it. And I think that's really where, you know, for an organisation that's on such a huge change tra trajectory, that's where the role of OD is, is critically important at the moment. So my current role is uh, is OD director for the Greater Europe region, and that sort of, I wear sort of two hats in that regard. One is making sure that I look after the wealth being and the and the, the the development and the performance of the OD team in the region. And the second hat is very much a practitioner hat. So working with a global business unit clients to drive the change that's required to align the org, to um, build out the capabilities. Uh, and, and that's really core to what we do. Uh, and I often think, Garen and Danny, that um, I, I love listening back to some of your other podcasts on this. Uh, and I think of my young nephew here in Australia who might listen to this at some time. He loves joking with me. But what do you actually do, Uncle A? Mm. You know, I mean, <laughs> he gets great fun about repeating that. What do, what, what do you actually do? Uh, and so uh, I think sometimes I think a good metaphor uh, can go a long way. And, and I sometimes think of the role of the OD director is really very much the orchestra manager mm -hmm. uh, and and i say intentionally uh, not the orchestra conductor uh, i'm not responsible for 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 leading the performance of the orchestra but i am responsible for having visibility to um you know information flows across every department how they liaise um how information uh, is gathered the programming strategy just just being aware and making sure that you have visibility to all of that what do audiences want uh, how well are we structuring in terms of all of our workflows? For I sometimes think about again the orchestra, the, the workflows, the talent, the auditions, uh, the education piece. So that I guess the orchestra manager then is ultimately um, ensuring that we have the capabilities uh, in this orchestra to deliver outstanding performances and we have the culture to do that on a sustainable basis. We can always turn out a great performance. Um, and I think it's a huge number of resonances for me, and I know other people who work in, in the OD space, that um, you know, the conductor, the leaders are ultimately responsible for picking up the baton and, and making the magic happen. But, but for us, we are responsible for just shaping and being aware and having visibility to all of those other working parts and making sure that they come together constantly to deliver such a high performance. Yeah, so that's a real deep understanding of how your organisation works and kind of the processes and systems and, and everything involved yeah I, I think so i think it's very much yeah the systems piece danny i fully agree um the ecosystem i would emphasize so the internal systems and the ecosystem um very much having your finger on the pulse of the health of your organization within that system and then i think the third part is just uh, as an od practitioner constantly holding up a mirror or challenging um, that we remain competitive and that we re and that we stay in that change path even after 55 years. So there's a lot of orchestras out there. There's a lot of people, you know, looking to get funding for their orchestra. Uh, and and how can an orchestra differentiate itself and, and deliver an amazing performance for an audience? So, yeah, that, that helps my nephew a little bit. Might, might help some really <laughs> What, what, what I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll drill a little bit deeper into that. And there's a lot of interesting points that we'd like to pick up on as well. We like the thing you said there about holding up the mirror. 
And for people like Kieran or others that that might be wanting to get into OD, we always ask this question, like, what was your journey? And and rarely has it ever been a linear answer. Did you ever speak to your careers teacher and they said, yep, the computer says OD. Like, what was your journey into it? Yeah, well, uh, I guess thinking about that, Garen, it's, um, yeah, on one hand, I could talk about the, the strategic HR masters that are in fact to do, or indeed with CIPD, the OD and D diploma. Uh, which was very good uh, a number of years ago. But but you're right. I think for me, there's a number of diverse strands that sort of come together in my life journey to bring us to OD. So I can talk to those a little bit. Um, and, and I think you're right. I think it is important to look at that. Um, one, if I go right back to my sort of late teens, early 20s, the first degree I completed in Colerain University in Northern Ireland was uh, communication studies. So everything to do with media, psychology, sociology. So straight out of college, became a journalist. And some of the, I think the rigor and the curiosity of the five years that I spent in journalism, still, I I share with colleagues all the time, this still stands to me. How can you digest a huge amount of information uh, pre-Google search, this was, Mm. uh, synthesize it, publish it, I mean, actually put it out, publish it uh, to such a high standard that um, I, I do that under the pressure of timeline. So I think that's one strand that, only in hindsight, I look back and see, you know, that that early sort of rigor and curiosity, asking great questions, that really, 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 I'd say would be the first sort of leg on the stool of my journey towards OD. I think the second one, again, in hindsight only, um, I would see that moving on from journalism, I had, um, maybe to tell the full story, I'd written several articles about the population in Ireland who are known as travellers, Irish travellers, so a very, very distinct population. Um sort of separated from the main population, if you like, sometime in the 1600s under Cromwell, which we won't go into. Uh, we, can, we, we can do that another time, maybe. <laughs> we'll do but, a podcast uh, too, that one. <laughs> exactly. So they, they have very unique challenges in life um, and a very interesting history and a very interesting story. And I just got to know some members of the community or, over the years in journalism and, and, and tried to bring their story a little bit. <laughs> but uh, when I finished journalism and was looking for my next step in life, I, I still had contact with some members of the traveller community. And I met two young men, incredibly brave young men, when I think back to it, mid-90s. Uh, they were not only travellers, but they were a gay couple. And they wanted to tell their story. They wanted to like massively break down boundaries. Um, and I was very aware of the sensitivity of the story and the prejudice that they, that they faced. But I published the piece uh, long story short, and it, it had a tremendous reaction. It had a tremendous reaction for them, overwhelmingly positive, I, I'm glad to say. But it also started a conversation in the sort of gay community in Ireland and in the traveller community about, you know, some aspects of social justice that haven't been touched upon before and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the end part of that story is randomly I got a call on my old um, Nokia 2010, the, the one that lasted a week, you know, you recharge it once and it went, went forever. Uh, and it was somebody I didn't know, but somebody I've become very close to since, and it's sort of a, an old time hero of mine, uh, a guy called Michael Barron. And what Michael was doing, he had worked in various parts of the community with migrants and with refugees and, and indeed with travelers. And he had set up a wonderful new organization called Belong To, which is still doing incredible work. But the idea of Belong To was that Michael, again, back in the 1990s, very radical stuff, wanted to create a safe space for young LGBT people in Ireland. And he wanted to, you know, work with government especially and work on education policy uh, around safety and well-being and uh, anti-bullying, etc. So Michael just said, look, um, there's a space on the board. We'd love to have you on board. Uh, we think you could do something with us. And and again, long story short, <clears throat> that was 10 years uh, as a non-exec director on the board and just doing pure pure OD uh, and system change work. So this was, you know, working with politicians, working with governments, working with the uh, president of Ireland at the time as our patron. That was quite a coup. Uh, Philanthropists. um, And, you know, although I didn't directly work with the young people themselves, just seeing when, you know, leaders, which they were, of course, uh, were unable to to find their voice, they could do incredible things. Like... um, a series of gay proms, just, you know, fabulous for, for, for those young people. Um, a huge campaign around standing up to homophobic bullying in schools, which has had massive impact uh, in Ireland. And, 
Yeah, and I think in the run up to even the, the marriage referendum, that historic moment in Ireland where Irish people went to a referendum to vote whether or not they would uh, have marriage equality. I think some of the stories of the young people that they wanted a, a brighter, better future was hugely impactful. So that's, again, a long way of saying the second leg of the stool for me was actually very much outside the corporate world, but doing, you know, fascinating, messy, complex, long-term OD work, which is, you know, a huge privilege um, to, uh, to look back on it. Uh, and then I would say, I think we touched on it before, Garen and Danny, the third leg of the stool very much in my journey was working with Engineers Ireland. So 10 years with an organisation that, if CIPD is the organisation for HR professionals, Engineers Ireland is the professional organisation for engineering professionals. So uh, I landed the, the, you know, the dream, dream, dream role. It wasn't called OD uh, in terms of the title, Director of Continuing Professional Development, but it was a government-funded programme to, to, to live the dream, to go out to mostly American multinationals to understand and codify what best practice was for them around leadership development, around OD, and then to port that to Indigenous Irish organisations so they could adopt best practice. And they did, in some cases, had radically, radically, radically transformed their organisations. So those 10 years, the exposure to other mega projects, you know, uh, airports, fast speed rail internationally huge logistic systems motorways a lot of motorways hospitals just just getting close to the leadership teams and seeing how they how they work through and at a very particular 10 years actually pre you know Cathy tiger years financial crash how do you use your capabilities to reinvent yourself that that was hugely um foundational and instructional for me i would say as an od practitioner again i didn't call it od at the time and then I just had this niggling voice, Danny and Garen, I'm sure you, you've, you've had it as well. Okay, I'm working with all these different clients across such a huge span. I wonder, could, could I go and work with, you know, their big corporate name and, and, and do that over a period of years and, and really shift the needle in that environment? And so I, I don't know, did I, I was going to say I found, I don't, I, I found Intel or Intel found me, it was a, it was a good marriage anyway. And uh, I promised I'd say for three years. Uh, and here we are 10 years later. Wow. I, uh, halfway through, I, f I was so captivated by that. I forgot I had to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many questions from that. <laughs> well, firstly, it's just, it's just a huge acknowledgement of the work that you did, like initially, like, you know, giving a voice to um, communities that don't necessarily have one and doing that work i think one of the things that's really nice of it is that you didn't have od in the title but you were doing od work you don't necessarily need that do you to to change and influence systems and i guess where are you taking your playbook from how are you knowing what to do during those times and when you were looking at these big messy complex systems and processes and pioneering and breaking new ground yeah i think two things on that one um certainly the balance of sort of working in Engineers Ireland, uh, full time, studying part time, believe it or not, and, and being on the board for those 10 years. Uh, it, it was probably sort of a, you know, pulling in very much in different sources at different times. And part of it would have been one, just looking at the rigor of, of the engineering brain, particularly the chartered engineer. The chartered engineer is a leader, a problem solver, very very, very ethical uh, and has ethical and moral considerations. That would have been a big part of my practice at the time for obvious reason. Um, and the welfare of people, obviously, in engineering and the welfare of society and the sustainability piece. So I think that had a huge influence on my practice. The other piece was we were very fortunate and belong to that uh, an organization called the One Foundation. People went to Google and came on board with funding. So we had exposure, Garen and Danny, to some really great strategists and OD practitioners and advisors. Uh, we had funding for a period to do that. So we had great, great, great people advising us. But I think the third thing for me I realized was nobody essentially has it figured out. So I, I couldn't find anyone who had the playbook. <laughs> uh, and, and Michael, God bless him, you know, the most amazing CEO didn't have the playbook, but there was a lot of trust that we, we just had to figure this out together. Uh, we had to, you know, empower these young people to go in the direction they wanted to go in. We we had to lead them very responsibly, but we had to give them a voice. And yeah, there was just a lot of figuring it out as we went along. Good point, Karen. There's a playbook there now how to do it. You know, Michael has 
codified it and shared it and he's gone on to do amazing things himself but um, there, there probably wasn't a playbook at the time so I think that's a, a, a good reflection for OD practitioners very few people have it figured out um, and so it's you know how, how can you create an environment and create conditions to to try something to be able to pause and reflect on that and see what did we get from that do we want to amplify that a bit more or do we want to kill it off quickly and try something else that was that was a big part of the active practice I'd say yeah, it's so important is that that being comfortable with not knowing. Sometimes it can create a defensive reaction where we feel we ought to te- comfort people that we know, but we don't because it's all completely new, isn't it? And so, just thinking about as you went into Intel, you made that shift. What are the biggest lessons that you took from your prior experience into Intel as you went in? Yeah, I think the thing that people would probably say about me, and uh, I'm very conscious about in my practice, is just making sure that we we might have some great ideas. So as a senior leadership team and working with a business unit senior team, internally, we might have some great ideas. But I think for me, particularly, you know, those three legs of the stool, the journalism piece and the belong to piece and, and the influence from Engineers Ireland and all of the clients I worked with there. I think the outside in, the customer led piece is probably the thing that I'm most passionate about and the biggest lesson learned, I would say, Danny, that I still carry with me. So if we are, you know, around a boardroom or whiteboarding, we might come up with some good ideas, but I think I, I still find that it's incredibly empowering to take a group of senior leaders and to switch up their world just by connecting them out to, as you mentioned, Danny, the system or the ecosystem. Mm. So what's what's the greatest pain point for the customer? Can you articulate that? What's the greatest gain point? That's not an expression, but, but you know, the, uh, the, the greatest gains you can deliver to the customer um, and if an organization leadership team who are working through an OD change or growing their capabilities or strategizing, I think if they can't articulate that, it's it's very, very, very instrumental for them to go back and be able to find out, you know, really what 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 are the needs of the customer. And inevitably then if you can address that, it's it's going to uh, lead to to a great outcome. So that's something I'm passionate about. That's something that you know I bring to my team in terms of you know supervising guiding the team and as a practitioner i would always find that it's, it's incredibly useful for for the leaders and sometimes surprising for the leaders to say oh um not quite sure and then it becomes okay how, how do you go about finding it, that out how do you go about connecting to the customer internally or indeed externally to find that out brilliant thank you so you talked there a bit about your your own od team at intel can you just tell us a little bit more about what that looks like how is it structured you know how do they work with the business yeah for sure so the OD team at Intel is a, a global team. So we're structured that we have a team in the US, we have a team in the greater Europe region, and we have a team in the greater uh, Asia region. Uh, we're very connected uh, despite the, the different time zones. And we, we did put a lot of effort into, particularly in the last 12 months, defining you know, what, what is our scope. Mm. So we're really thinking about, <clears throat> uh, given the... Um, pain points and, and, and what our customers want to gain, or Intel customers, I mean, uh, what, what are the services that we as an OD team need to deliver? So we really put a lot of effort into, into scoping that um, and deciding that there's some things we don't do in OD, mm-hmm. but just being taking time together to be really, really, really clear on what we do. Um, and I think with that focus, Danny and Garen, it allowed us then to also look at something which is really important for OD at the moment. What, what are the skills uh, what what skills do we need to be able to deliver those services? I yeah. think that has been a really interesting journey for us. Uh, yeah, the consulting piece, the diagnosis piece, the the um, analytical piece, the the ability to synthesize, as you mentioned, just you know, re- getting it really crisp in terms of you know, there's about eight different skills that we can we can assess ourselves on, we can we can grow ourselves on. That matrix has been really really interesting. So wonderful discussions, I'd say, around self as instrument, mm. which you know is very OD, but really, you know, your level of self awareness, your ability to just be very present uh, in your practice, uh, and your ability to sort of um, you know shift, shift and uh, on a dime almost, depending on what's emerging, depending on what comes up. So I think that we've had some great discussions and very purposeful uh, interventions to continue to grow the team. And I'd say the last thing is just um, thinking about all the time. So we have the services piece, the skills piece, the standards piece, I'd say, Danny and Garen. You know, the world is changing so fast. The, the challenges are changing so fast. 12-month 
months ago, there wasn't much talk about AI. Yeah, it was there, and uh, you know maybe there's a chatbot popped up in the corner of your your screen now and again. But now it's you know we're just hurting uh, towards a very exciting future with AI. So all the time thinking about what are the standards, the models, the frameworks, what's cutting edge uh, when it comes to uh, delivering our services. So yeah, we, we spend a lot of time just mm. being very clear on that, helping each other with that, constantly renewing that. So that seems to serve as well. Yeah, and I guess one of the challenges with OD is that OD, you know, generally has very capable people in it, and they can turn their hand to lots of different organisational challenges and issues, and will bring an enterprise mindset to things. And obviously, if you are very clear, these are things that we do, and these are things that we don't. Sometimes our stakeholders don't quite understand that there's boundaries. Like, how do you either a educate your stakeholders about what you can and can't do, and how do you sort of maintain discipline within the team to make sure that they're focused on doing the right things, or is it an ongoing tension to manage? Yeah, I think it's an ongoing tension. I think a couple of things on that. So it definitely rings a bell with me that um, back to the the orchestra manager piece again. That OD professionals and OD practitioners are some of the most wonderful artists and and performers that I've ever met and worked with you know they're, they're very creative very astute um very compassionate courageous people and then you try and put a framework around them and uh, 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 and rules and structures so so there's there's obviously a tension there definitely um i think it's back to the orchestra manager the metaphor and why that's so powerful for me it's thinking about okay i have my harpist here and uh, knowing what I know about that person, their background, their experience, their personality, their per- maybe what's going on in their personal life. How am I working with that individual to, to allow them to, to perform at their best? Um, and likewise, I have, you know, another I- instrument here. And ha- how am I working with that person? Probably in a slightly different way. So I think as a, as a sort of a, a manager of a team of OD practitioners, it's very much just understanding what, how do I get the best of each one of those people, know, knowing where they are, knowing how they tick. And then with our clients, um, I think it's back to Garen and Danny, something that we probably still don't do enough of in the OD world, is which is, you know, contracting, 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 and then doing a little bit more contracting. And then as we start the work, doing more contracting. And then as we get into what the work really is, recontracting. And then when we're midway, contracting, because now we actually know what we're doing. I love and that. ABC, yeah. always be contracting. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And so I think for me, at the start of that work, there's a bit of pre-framing. Again, I don't, I'm not sure if that's a word, where you know we this is good enough for now in terms of what we're doing together, but we will be constantly, constantly, constantly calibrating as we go because of the type of work we're doing, the pace of the work we're doing. Um, yeah, he, here's a few stakes in the ground we can put down for sure, Garen and Danny. But yeah, that, that contracting piece is, in practice, as you both know, a very very real part of the work we do and and it's an intrinsic part of that sort of like clarifying expectations of each other and having those sort of open conversations i think so um i I think that's very important to understand the client's needs and wants and desires but again i think it's incredibly powerful and something that we based on our grovian culture they keep bringing it back to the customer so yes i get that that this is important to you and this is important to you as as a business unit client if you like but but Again, let's flip it to, you know, what, what is the customer needing? What are they looking for? What's going to be success for them? Um, and so, again, I think that's where the tension is, Baron. Yeah, it's um, there's a certain scope of work that you could agree with the client, but there's a, scur- a certain scope of work that the customer is actually paying for, if you like. And so that's that's what we need to deliver together. That's that's what success looks like. And so it's that's the tension the whole way through, I think. So you're kind of you're you're holding the voice of the customer through the conversations as well. Um, the the Grovian culture is really interesting, isn't it? If anyone's watching this, there's a great book that Andy Grove actually wrote, which became a bit of a textbook. Is it only the paranoid survive, which is possibly the best book title <laughs> I've ever seen? And he's got some really big principles in there, isn't he? And it, it is absolutely customer obsession, isn't it? The customer has to be understood and, and heard throughout. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. I think there's some of those Grovian principles that just, you know, immaculately stand the test of time. So the first one is being very, you know, being very results driven. And, and you know, if you commit to do something for a customer, then you you do absolutely whatever it takes to execute on that. So you, you'd sense that DNA in Intel, in Intel. And then there's for sure the customer focus, which is a huge part of what we do. And then really, I think the other big part for Andy and the founding I was going to say founding fathers, I'm sure the founding mothers as well, you know, instituted in, in Intel is just that 
again, rigor and ethics and, you know, appreciating the diversity of voice and the diversity of view and the ability to have what used to be called constructive confrontation, I think, in Andy's print, and now is more constructive conversation than courageous conversation. So it's probably moved on a little bit. But yeah, all those tenants are incredibly important to the work that we still do at Intel today, very much connected to the customer, as you said. If we have a great science project internally, it's it's only a value if it really, really, really makes the you know the customer start saying. So we're super conscious of that. Fabulous. So that's told us quite a lot about your role and, and what you love about OD. I guess what do you find most challenging about working in in organization development? Oh, that's a great question, Danny. I think I would reflect that the work that we do is inherently challenging. Mm. And I think that's, yeah, I think you're, that's a great question. I think we do swim in a sea of challenging work. And so definitely to my mind, that's important in terms of sort of making peace with that as an OD practitioner. The work we do is complex and it's challenging. Um, and the way I would think about it is that it's, it's a privilege to be doing that kind of work. You know, we're not we're not up on the beach. We're we're in the water that's choppy and challenging. And um, you know, again, that's that's a really great place to be. I think the challenge probably then is just managing many of those tensions that you mentioned. So um, working with amazing people, allowing them to really show up and perform at their best. And I think a challenge, apart from all those areas that we've covered so far, is just being very conscious as that orchestra leader of when you're watching all those moving parts uh, and you're working with so many different stakeholders and eventually it comes for the moment for the conductor to pick up the baton and, and, and the music begins and hopefully it's magic. How as an OD professional can you make sure that you take the time to then, you know, be, be the resilience practitioner, you know, the, the, the thing we always talk about and, and find the growth notes and who gives you those growth notes um, and do you have a supervisor or do you have a coach or do you have a mentor or do you have that constellation so I think there's so much work and you could move so fast it's not possible I think to tread water constantly so I think a, a challenge given the type of work we do and the pace of the work we do and the scale of the work we do is where can you find the time to 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 just constantly be calibrating your own resilience and it looks very different for everybody um, and we you know, enable our clients to do that. Sometimes in HR and as OD professionals, we need to make sure that we're we're really good at doing that ourselves. So I think that's an ongoing challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So is that is that supervision kind of mentoring consultancy model something you have in place for your OD practitioners in, in Intel? Oh yeah, very much, Danny. Yeah, I think that's really, really, really important. It's a part of the role that I love. So again, as I mentioned those kind of dual strands. So part of my role and what I get measured on is how well are my team. And uh, how are my team developing back to our services, skills, yeah. huge emphasis, standards, um, and how are they performing? Yeah. So really the well-being of that team. And then the other part is being practitioner. So you've got skin in the game, your 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 practice is always alive, you're very, very connected to the business and your business acumen. Uh, but for sure, yeah, the 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 only reason that we get great impact and great results is because the, the team are healthy and well. Yeah, and I guess I think with organisations, there's there's often sort of view it as a choice: either we go fast or we go moderately paced, and we will emphasise sort of employee experience. But Intel drives at a breakneck speed. Even Gordon Moore, one of the founding fathers, was the instigator of Moore's Law, which probably educate. What what is Moore's Law? Yeah, well, pre pretty much Moore's Law is um, comes from economics, so you're pretty much saying that. At its simplest, you're doubling something every two years. Yeah. So on on transistors, you're talking about you're doubling the path. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller all the time. But you're doubling the capability or the the number of transistors that you have on that chip. So yeah, it's just about constantly shrinking the architecture, Darren, but constantly doubling the performance of that. So you're really giving yourself a a, a double whammy challenge, if you like. Yeah. Shrink the architecture and make it more powerful. Yeah. So this relentless march towards um, constant innovation, this constant competitive environment as well. Yet the stats like Glassdoor, Intel consistently performs exceptionally well on it. I think Glassdoor actually awarded your CEO the, the CEO of the Year Award as well. 
how do you have that relentless fast pace and yet still emphasize well-being and i guess obviously what what is od's role in that yeah great i think i think a couple of reflections on that i would say that maybe if i maybe if i zoom out first of all i think the history that you're referring to is important karen and danny i think that's sort of um almost an anthropological approach to it you know that we have these you know sort of luminary figures they have documented their thoughts and their philosophy and that's alive and well in our values and our culture today so if you come and you are fortunate enough to have a role at intel you you know the environment and you know the culture and you know the, the values that are incredibly tied to what we do and i think there's a a very strong sense, particularly Pat, who was mentored by Andy Grove, actually, and, and the senior leadership team and everybody that, that I work with, we would have a view at a very high level that, you know, we're here for, especially as I get older, we're here for a, a time at Intel, but really we do a great job if we move the organization forward and pass it on um, more healthy to the next generation, um, which are always coming up through the ranks. So I think that sort of philosophy right back to the founding fathers that we mentioned is important. I think the second thing, Karen and Danny, I don't know about your own views, I think employees are just incredibly smart. This sense that um, if an organization is in stasis and, and isn't changing, well, that's it's probably a little bit worrying, you know, given the, the environment of the world that we live in. So I think employees almost expect that the, there is a constant force and a constant push to be better, to raise the bar, uh, to have very high standards. And I think OD plays a, a hugely important part in that, not only to make sure that the performance of the organization is great, but clearly, if we do that well, then that has a, a, a very important role on the employee, something I feel very passionate about. We sometimes sort of ask employees to show up or talk about them in fractions. And we're, we're all very whole, holistic, rounded individuals. I see, because, probably because I've been here now 10 years, you know, the, the great environment that Intel has, you know, challenging people and supporting people, that has an impact on the individuals, has an impact on their teams, it has an impact on their families, it has an impact on their children, it has an impact on the, the amazing things they can go and do outside of work in terms of the volunteering and the charity work. and the, So the, that sort of philosophy is bigger. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's a little bit of a philosophical answer, but it's very real and tangible on the ground as well. The work we do in OD should create better organizations and that has a very real impact on on real individuals i would say yeah i guess a lot of organizations it's the, the senior leadership that have to persuade them to embark on this relentless whereas i guess you're describing it comes intrinsically because people are they want to be challenged and they see it's part of it as well fascinating what what kind of impacts have you seen from your efforts we, we love examples of, of pieces of work that you're particularly proud of it's really important to share those things what, what comes to mind yeah, I think uh, for obvious reasons, it's a little bit difficult to talk about some, some specifics in yeah. relation to Intel and some of the work we do. I think, um, you know, the impact is, again, multifaceted. So I, I think, you know, definitely if you're working with an organization, you're, you're going to be looking at the indicators of organization health, how well the organization has changed, a very passionate again on how would you measure that success? Well, go ask the customer. Mm. Uh, and something sometimes we overlook, but hopefully, uh, you know, if we can get some indicators from the customer, I think that that is impact. And it looks very different customer to customer, but I think that's a very, very, very important touchstone again to come back to that. Uh, hopefully, in the organisation, as you as you work, the senior leadership team, I think I would see now again, having been here for a number of years, Garen and Danny, that the senior leadership team probably should also come away impacted in a way that they have their organization capabilities, but also their le senior leadership team capabilities. And I mention that because if I work with an organization for 12 days or 12 weeks or 12 months, and eventually I might, you know, the contract ends and I'm stepping away, there will be something. Um, and over the years, you know, whether it's financial crash or COVID or an ash cloud over Iceland or, you know, a ship jammed in the Suez Canal, you know, whatever it is, I, I'm always interested to see that the senior leadership team, if you've grown their capabilities, they, they can still manage to cope with that. that we, we never discussed that. That was never in our plans. But you've left the organization team, uh, the senior leadership team, in, in such a healthy way that they can cope with the next unexpected thing. So I think growing the learning capability of the senior leadership team, for me, would always be a really, really, really important indicator to look at. And, and hopefully, so in that way, the work that we do in OD is 
is exponential. You know, it's living on long after we've stepped away. Yeah, as I say, we often say that we were temporary scaffolding for whoever we're working with and kind of part of that OD philosophy and kind of mindset is leaving them better equipped to carry on in a sustainable way. So yeah, completely with you on that. Uh, so Aidan, um, one of the questions we would like to know is, is what's the, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned in your role so far? Yeah, I think actually even preparing for today has been very interesting, just reflecting back. I think um, if I go back over my career, Danny and Garen, at a personal level, I would have had a certain um, approach to trying to, you know, be very, very well prepared in terms of expertise and models and frameworks. And not quite, you know, working with the client that I want to teach this to them, but bring bring a, a model or framework very central to the practice that I have. Um, you know, a little bit fearful that I didn't know enough, a little bit fearful that I wasn't good enough, a little bit fearful that these incredible engineers and technicians who are so brilliant and I'm so in awe of, uh, how can I ever bring value to them? And I think the biggest lesson, which probably just comes with time and practice, is that, as we mentioned earlier on, in change and transformation, absolutely nobody has it figured out. So you're working with brilliant people who I'm still in awe of, but the, the reason you're in the room is to help them create value. And to help them create value, you have to hold up the mirror that we mentioned. Uh, you have to be comfortable with, with challenge. Um, the environment won't always be, it won't always be safe in virtual commons. It'll always be supportive, but, but and we're going to have to go to the edges. We're going to have to push things. And again, that brings me back to that sort of self as instrument, but really just your, your own ability to be self-aware and to have done a lot of self-work. So I think probably I'd nail it in two ways. One is the biggest lesson there is that, again, nobody has it figured out. But two is that if you if you are to step into this arena, which is a wonderful, wonderful, amazing arena, and I know you're both passionate about OD and supporting OD and, and the work you do outside of your own work as well, I, I think it's just not being afraid to do that self-exploration. So if it's um, formally, you know, like therapy and counselling, or if it's for you, if it's yoga and extreme sports, just, just or dance or circling or what you know, just whatever the whatever the thing is that's going to get you to really, really, really understand more about yourself. And maybe even the podcast today, you know, a little bit more about your own journey, a little bit more about what informs your practice, a little bit more about what triggers you, a little bit more about what your sort of particular gifts and talents are, um, and bring that to the party. I think again, nobody has it figured out. So if you can bring that to the party and help the organization create value for the customer, then I think that's all you can do. So I'd be far more, I think, passionate, and I would give myself more of a break in terms of the way I approach things today than I would have done 20 years ago, 10 years ago. I think that's that's a really important part of the journey, a really important lesson. Mm, yeah, that self is instrument. It's, it's, it's the space that you create, isn't it? And giving people the making it safe enough for people to to be open and say they don't know as well. Um, you, you just mentioned that the, the mirror thing has been consistent thread throughout the conversation. What what are some of the techniques that you would potentially deploy to help hold that mirror up? Obviously, you're in different settings. Sometimes you're with a whole team. Sometimes you're one to one. Sometimes it might be, um, you know, uh, a, a more intimate conversation in the corridor, or whatever. Like, what what are some of the things that you would deploy to help people understand the mirror? And, yeah, I, so I think it, it definitely depends by context and just being very sensitive to the environment and who you're dealing with and and the the you know the sort of relationships that are there and the politics that are there. But I think sometimes it's something very 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 simple, Danny and Garen, and as you both know, it sometimes it's just and why would you do that and 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 just sit back and you know. So I'm a great fan of just scratching my head and sort of and and what would the benefit of that possibly be and and then. You know, and then just let, so um, it's maybe not confrontational and direct, but maybe it's just asking a sort of, you know, again, back to the journalism days, just asking a really inquisitive, genuinely curious question to find out why the blazes would they go down that road. And if they can articulate it great, or sometimes that, that opens up and, and uh, you know, a great exploration and conversation. So I think simple probing questions are probably the way to go rather than, yeah, I know we say holding up the mirror and that can that can sound uh, very blunt and very confrontational. And sometimes it does need to be, but more often than not, it's asking a good, curious question, I think is hugely valuable. And let the, silence do, yeah, let the silence do the heavy lifting afterwards, isn't it? Yeah. Giving, people that, yeah, giving people that space just to articulate their thoughts. Kind of the, they draw their own conclusions, don't they? Just having that, that opportunity. Yeah. 100% done, yeah. 
fabulous. So I think just one last question. Um, I, we're going to we, we we were so excited about this conversation. So, so uh, we'll, yeah, we'll go for one last question. One last question. We'll, we'll squeeze every last second out of this. <laughs> Brilliant. So just there'll be all sorts of people listening to the podcast. They might already be doing OD or considering a career in organisation development. What would you say to somebody who's thinking about that? What what advice would you give them? Oh, fabulous. Well, yeah, I would say it's a wonderful, wonderful, very diverse, very challenging, very fulfilling space to work in. And I would say there's no rush. So I think genuinely, when you step into the space, you do have to, back to the, maybe for the last time, the metaphor of the orchestra manager, you do have to know what sort of instrument you are. You know, you do have to know, are you a piano? Are you a guitar? Are you a harp? Or maybe you're on the drums. And so, you know, what, what do you uniquely bring to the space? Um, how do you operate? Um, so I think plenty of time on the, the life experience, uh, the self-work, and just um, don't be afraid to go off and explore. So you could you could try something very, very different altogether and benefit from that. You could uh, be on a board uh, and volunteer some, somewhere and get something great from that. So I, I think um, it's a wonderful space to work in. I would say enjoy building up a really rich experience. And I know it's applied for both of you as well. You can then bring that very, very, very diverse experience to, to the OD field. But quite possibly along the journey, you won't be calling it OD at all. Um, and, and then with all those that, that wonderful range of instruments that you can play and the, the great understanding that you can bring so it's maybe someday um you realize ah that's od I'm, I'm perfectly equipped to go work in the od space brilliant well, well thank you so much Aim. We're, we're hugely appreciative of your time you know you're an intensely busy person as well we're taking so much away from this conversation you know the importance of holding up the mirror never letting go of that curiosity the importance of you know simplicity and simple questions not mm -hmm. questioning yourself too much just understand the importance of sort of self as instrument the importance of having real clarity in terms of what you do and the value you bring and, and having boundaries around that too and, and also the role of being in the orchestra and 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 how you actually make sure that you get the, the the best music out of everyone and it sounds like a lot of this is without ego you know it's that 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 part of that is putting it to the side allows you to do great work it's really heartening to know that people like you are out in the field doing great work in organizations like intel um so i know people have got a lot from it so so thank you so much uh, and a word of warning i'll be back to both of you because i'm, I'm doing an external benchmarking exercise at the moment. so i want to pick your brains and uh, what you're hearing and, and the clients you're working with and what's going on in your world so you you owe me one now a, a very fair trade, <laughs> a fair trade. <laughs> brilliant thanks so much Aidan. really appreciate it thanks a million folks thanks aiden <laughs>